Okay, so I should just speak? I can, okay. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna get started. Um, my name is David Pollins. I'm head of the Poetry Committee here at Helix. And I wanna welcome you to the first poetry event in our tradition series a series which will be devoted to the appreciation of literary traditions that are less familiar to a general audience. Uh, for future events in this series, we have begun preparations to organize programs on the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish, on Native American poetry, on modern Yiddish poetry, and the literary beauty of the Quran. Uh, you know, I wanted to make a general announcement too um, that uh, we wanted to apologize for the cancellation of the round table last week on love, which has been rescheduled for next Saturday. And uh, upcoming in the Helix series is the topology of fear. Uh, what's the date on that? March 9th. March 9th. On March 16th, we'll have the first event in our legacy series in poetry a series that's dedicated to the work of English language poets. Our first event is a discussion of the poetry of Elizabeth Bishop and includes Bonnie Costello, Alice Quinn, Lloyd Schwartz, and Jean Valentine. We're currently planning an event for the fall on John Donne and his influence on contemporary poetry, and that's being co-sponsored with Fordham University and the New York Public Library. I want to thank the members of the Poetry Committee, Felix, who are helping to prepare our events. They are Heather Dubrow, Rachel Haddis, Henry Levine, Patrick Rosal, and Polly Rosenwake. Today we're very fortunate to have Francis Pritchett and Mustafa Menai with us to talk about the poetry of Ghalib, the great 19th century poet of the Urdu and Persian literary traditions. He was a preeminent master of the poetic form that I used to call Ghazal, but now know better and pronounce guzzle. Mustafa Menai's lecture of Urdu at the University of Pennsylvania, South Asia Studies. Francis Pritchett is professor of modern Indic languages in the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies at Columbia University. She presides over a wonderful website devoted largely to the poetry of Mir and Ghalib, which we will have the opportunity to view today as our two presenters guide us into the world of Ghalib. Before turning the floor over to our presenters, I'd like to draw your attention to a charitable foundation that is special to them, the Hoshar Foundation. Did I pronounce that correctly? <laughs> Which is dedicated to providing opportunities for education and empowerment to the girls of Pakistan. I'll distribute some information about the foundation in the hope that you will find it worthy of your support. I now turn the presentation over to Mustafa and Francis. Well, thank you very much, David. That's a really nice introduction, and um, we appreciate your coming out on, a, on such a very pretty Saturday afternoon, because I know for most of you this is an intellectual adventure and not something that you're already familiar with or interested in, so that deserves more credit and, and more okay. admiration for your intellectual curiosity and, and outreach. So we'll try to make life interesting as best we can for the next hour and a half. Um, I would like to begin by just reading a brief little historical and analytical presentation about the Guzzel, just to touch on, touch on a number of points that will help you sort of feel oriented about it. And then we can move on and, and discuss any of the, any of the um, particulars in detail and look at one verse. Um, I know the, the viewing angle isn't ideal, but on our screen back there, we have the one photograph ever taken of Mirza Ghalib, the great poet that we're gonna talk about today. Um, this was, was done in 1868, and he died in 1869. And in 1868, photography was just coming to Delhi, where he lived. And in his letters, you can see there are references that he makes um, um, to how, oh, his friends had urged him to go, to have a photograph made, but the photographer hadn't come. He expected him to come to his house, not to go to a studio. And it was too much trouble, and who, who minded? But then there was another occasion, and so finally the photographer did come, and it's very moving, because we have all sorts of miniature paintings of this man. Let's just take a brief look. And you see it's a different world. When you move into the world of miniature paintings, you are, you are, you know, 
at one, at one more remove from our world. And you have to imagine the background and imagine the kind of poetic and painting and artistic uh, conventions that are being used. Um, these are all just interesting bits and pieces from my website. I'm, I'm just showing them for fun. But this is, they, these, these early photographs were pasted onto like visiting cards and you would give them as mementos to your friends. So this is a visiting card that had been preserved in the family of, of a friend of mine for a long time and it's very faded, but this is the, the best access we'll ever have to what Ghalib actually looked like. Then we have, of course, the later, later visions by modern Pakistani writers of what, uh, what they think about Ghalib or the impressions that they have. And here is an, an art student um, whom I know has imagined that Ghalib would appear on a Pakistani rupee note, <laughs> although that actually hasn't happened, but, but he's just experimenting with the, the view in a, in a sort of free-ranging free way. But let me, let me just give you a little background about the, um, the genre and the poet. The word guzzle means something like conversations with women. Like the genre itself, it originated in 6th century Arabic verse. Early Arabic guzzle revolved around two broad themes, the rakish celebration of wine, women, and song, and the elegiac lament over lost love. By the time the ghazal passed into Persian from the early 11th century onward, this second theme had come to have mystical overtones. Separation and suffering were at the heart of love, and the faithful longing lover was even a kind of martyr. Through Persian, the medieval ghazal also came to develop major traditions in Turkish and Urdu. Nowadays, among these languages, the ghazal remains alive only in Urdu. If we focus on the classical, that is, 18th and 19th century ghazal in Urdu, the two greatest poets of this tradition were Mir Muhammad Taqi Mir, 1722 to 1810, and Mirza Asadullah Khan Ghalib, 1797 to 1869. Formally speaking, a ghazal is a set of two-line verses. They aren't technically couplets, since in most of them the two lines don't rhyme. And in a couplet, usually the two lines rhyme. Ideally, there are, there are to be an odd number of them. And ideally, the number is to be something like seven or nine. Um, could, could we make the sound louder? Would that help? Would that make it easier, sir? Is it OK? OK. Um, they, these verses share a strictly defined Arabic-derived quantitative meter. And at the end of each verse, they also share a common rhyme syllable, and after it, usually a common repeated refrain word or words as well. Beyond this, the verses of a ghazal share only the larger ghazal universe of stylized characters, scenes, actions, and images. A ghazal, in short, is a series of semantically independent two-line mini-poems that have a strong formal unity, but usually no particular unity beyond that. Thus, in performance, oral reciters and singers freely rearrange the verses of a guzzle and almost always omit a good number of them. The first verse of a guzzle commonly incorporates the rhyme and refrain at the end of both lines instead of only at the end of the second line. If it does this, it's called an opening verse. There's a special name for it, matla. Under oral performance conditions, this feature enables the listeners to perceive the formal structure of the guzzle more quickly. And we'll illustrate this when we, when we look at an, an example later on. The last verse commonly includes the poet's chosen pen name. If it does this, it's called a closing verse, a makta. Both these features reflect the guzzle's expectation of oral performance. The traditional venue for oral performance was the mushaira, uh, the poetry place. Sher is poetry, shair is the poet, mushaira is the, the performance of poetry. Uh, the mushaira consisted of a smallish group of patrons, connoisseurs, master poets called ustads, and apprentices, shagirds. Most mushairas were based on a well-known pattern line announced in advance, so that everybody's guzzles composed in this pattern were formally identical, sharing meter, rhyme, and refrain. 
This formal identity made them extremely comparable to each other, so that individual achievement stood out very strikingly. Recitation of the first line of a verse was always followed by a long pause full of praise and comment from the audience, after which the first line was repeated, and then finally followed by the second line. This style of presentation created a time period when the audience had access to the first line but not the second, with possibilities for creating suspense, misdirection, surprise, and so on, that became major factors, along with complex wordplay, in the development of the Guzzle's poetics. Poets recited in order of increasing seniority because the emphasis on apprenticeship over time and the required mastery of technical skills made it apparent to the, the organizers of Mushairas that the senior most poets must be politely assumed to be the finest. Of course, sometimes they weren't, so their tensions were created there. Um, everybody had a small notebook in which he, and we have to say he because women very rarely attended Mushairas, a small notebook in which he quickly jotted down verses that struck his fancy for later discussion with friends. Famous poets were often the rock stars of their day. Bands of their apprentices were even known, <coughs> known to riot when they encountered each other in the streets of Lucknow. Although the majority of Ghazal poets were upper or middle class Muslim men, Ghazals by women, by people of other religions, including Hindus, Sikhs, and Christians, and by people of working class backgrounds are amply documented. All poetry is made out of other poetry, but not all poetry is glad of it. The guzzle, however, delights in its huge treasury of earlier verses. The very origins of Urdu poetry included macaronic or mixed Persian Urdu lines and verses. The classical training for a poet included memorizing literally thousands of verses by earlier Persian and Urdu ustads. There were various technical terms for the deliberate or inadvertent use of another poet's line or idea or image. If deliberate, it was either a tribute or a challenge, or usually both. If inadvertent, was it a creative coincidence, an innovative development, or a vulgar imitation? And was every usage of the early masters sacred, or should modern idiom have legitimacy as well? Mushairas functioned as technical workshops in which issues like these could be publicly debated. At the most basic level, the guzzle is the first person voice of a passionate lover who laments his lack of access to his beloved. This lover is always construed as masculine. In some verses, the beloved is very clearly feminine, as for example, when women's clothing, veiling, etc., is mentioned. She is then either a courtesan or an inaccessible lady in parda. In other verses, the beloved is very clearly masculine as when the beginnings of the coquettish adolescent boy's beard are said to appear, destroying his androgynous charm. In most verses, the gender of the beloved can't be decided for sure. This undecidability is partly due to the brevity of the verses and to the emphasis on the lover's feelings rather than the descriptions of the beloved. In Persian, it's also due to the nature of the grammar. Verb endings don't vary with gender. In Urdu, the beloved is always treated as grammatically masculine. And ultimately, this abstractly masculine gender is also due to the desire to keep open a mystical, sophistic reading in which the supremely powerful and irresistibly beautiful divine beloved is the real object of desire. Since an erotic pursuit of God especially by a male lover, is not only supremely transgressive, but also bound to end badly. The lover knows from the beginning that his passion is doomed and will destroy him. But he doesn't care, since it's so much more powerful and beautiful than anything on offer in this flimsy, transitory, real life. Thus, the great metaphors of the lover's condition are the universal mystical ones of helplessness and or transcendence. And the four biggest are, not surprisingly, you'll recognize them if you know anything about mystical poetry, drunkenness, sex, madness, and death. And here's where we connect with, no doubt, psychoanalytic interests too. The stylized settings of the guzzle world, the garden, the desert, the wine house, the prison, and so on, 
and its supporting cast of characters, the rival, the messenger, the doorkeeper, the advisor, the ascetic, etc., are all carefully calibrated to accompany this passion play. Some modern readers in South Asia have worried over the depiction of the beloved as a beautiful boy. The implications of pederasty distress them. But if the beloved can be envisioned as a beautiful boy or a courtesan, he can also be God. And plainly, the Ghazal lives in a world of its own, and thus is the very reverse of autobiographical. For if the beloved is a denizen of that Ghazal world, so too is the lover, who can speak as a caged bird, a hunted animal, a naked madman, a drunkard, or as himself after his own death. This is one of the enjoyable parts of the, of the guzzle. The lover is doomed, he dies, but it never stops him. He doesn't shut up, he keeps right on, right on composing poetry about his, what happens after his death. Um, the point is the transgressiveness, the liminality, the rush to break out of this flawed, doomed, limited, worldly life into a larger, truer universe of passion. The moth flying into the candle flame is thus one of the guzzle's emblematic images. The burning, melting, self-consuming candle itself is another. And the blossoming rose, whose smile is also her death warrant as she blooms, is a third. The classical guzzle world, with its aristocratic patronage and its famous ustads, was killed off in the aftermath of the rebellion of 1857. Guzzles nowadays in Urdu are often either obscure and elite, printed in small poetry journals, or else popular and personally expressive, or even filmy, composed for Bollywood movies. Modern mushairas too, though they still exist, and though they happen all over, all over North America, including in quite a number in our town, modern mushairas are greatly changed. They are public performances like concerts, presided over by popular MCs who adjust the performances to the mood of the audience. To some extent, these mushairas constitute a middle ground for the guzzle between the elite and the popular in which it can continue to survive. The, there is also now English guzzle to add to the picture. Um, it's become a popular genre in recent decades and a very, a very um, influential and fascinating book called Ravishing Disunities by the late Agha Shahid Ali is a very good point of entry for the English guzzle. So I've studied the guzzle for my, most of my scholarly career, but otherwise I'm an outsider. I'm from Arkansas. Um, I started studying Hindi at 20 and, and Urdu at 22. Um, so it's very nice that uh, we also have here a very extreme insider, my friend Mustafa Minai, who is of course not only an insider as, as a South Asian, but also he is an insider as a direct descendant of a well-known Urdu poet called Amir Minai, who was a junior contemporary of Ghalib's. And in Ghalib's old age, the young man Amir Minai often helped him write his letters and acted as a secretary to him. And so we have actually a sort of blood connection here. So I'd like to ask Mustafa what he would add to, what he would add to this description or, or what he would change. Sure, thanks a lot, friend. And uh, first of all, just as Urdu has the ability to really absorb uh, so many different words and philosophies and styles from all over the world, I would say that you're not at all an outsider because Urdu has embraced you with open arms just as you have embraced Urdu as well. Um, and uh, thanks a lot for your um, introduction. And um, I would just say that, uh, yes, just as Fran made the point that uh, she's, had, um, she's had a scholarly connection to Urdu and its study, which of course is very deep and very expansive. Um, when I had um, an experiential connection to it before I had a scholarly connection. So I was, um, when I was coming of age and really understanding poetry, I was reacting to it on an emotional level, which of course is the experience that most people have of poetry rather than uh, studying it to begin with. Um, and so the 
the experience of uh, ghalib and uh, poetry uh, in general <coughs> is at a very deep emotional level as well. And so an emotional understanding based on one's uh, life experiences, on personality, on one's um, psycho psychology, personality, et cetera, comes first. And then after that, because the ghazal can be, and ghazal poetry can be interpreted in so many uh, levels, when you start studying it, more meanings, et cetera, come, uh, come, come to light. Um, and uh, just uh, because I was experiencing it in the, in the modern times, so I would say that yes, uh, the ghazal uh, definitely um, had uh, growing pains, was uh, battered by the outrageous slings and arrows of fortune, et cetera, but uh, it does survive. Um, it has changed quite a bit, um, although the, uh, the formal structure of the rhyme and meter, et cetera, still remains uh, as well. But a lot of new themes have been infused into it. Um, uh, and I believe that that process uh, would not have been as robust of, of innovation if it were not for Ghalib. Uh, because Ghalib, I feel, was a major uh, innovator in terms of using the same kinds of classical metaphors and vocabulary, but infusing new themes, which were coming uh, from his personality as well as his uh, uh, as well as, as well as his times as well. Um, just a, a small point uh, about when uh, uh, um, Fran had mentioned that the first verse is called a matla, and uh, in true um, Urdu uh, literary um, uh, tradition, even that is is a beautiful word play because matla also means the sky. And so figuratively, the first share of a ghazal, when you call it the matla, you can poetically think of it as the sky, the rest of the shares, the rest of the couplets are descending from it after that. And so that, that sets up a, a, a whole range of poetic images as well. Um, and um, even one thing that has also changed is this, the grammatically masculine reference in, in uh, Urdu poetry has also evolved and changed as well. So now in these days and times you find a lot of um, women poets um, and uh, they use the feminine uh, gender as well as the masculine gender um, according to uh, however they prefer to apply it uh, as well. Um, and uh, yes, without further ado, I think we can get uh, more into Ghalib then. Uh, are there any special questions? I mean, I, I think we're, we're basically planning to have a question period afterwards, but is there anything anybody would, would like to raise or to, to ask at this point? Since we're a small group, it seems that we should be informal. Did you have a question? Yes, um, the actual translation of the word is that conversations with... With women. With women, that's what I... Yeah, there's, there's another etymology um, that, that attributes the word to the dying cry of a gazelle. But I think that's a sort of folk, folk etymology. Right, there's the word ghazalan as well, uh, which I think, um, Fran, you might know better. It, does that refer to a deer? Well, there is, the, there is, gazelle has a cognate for, for right. a gazelle in, in Urdu, but, right. but I think that the etymology is a folk etymology. Okay. Sure. Absolutely. Actually, it's interesting about Omar Khayyam because we, we think of him through Fitzgerald, right? Um, we read the Rubaiyat of Fitzgerald, the quatrains um, translated from Omar Khayyam, but it's one of those very free translations that we nowadays would call transcreations. So actually, Fitzgerald wrote an original poem in English that was very loosely based on Omar Khayyam, and it was far more successful in English than Omar Khayyam ever was in, in Persian. Um, and in fact, I think Penguin has, one of the publishers has put out literal translation of Omar Khayyam, and you can barely recognize the, the Fitzgerald um, approach. You can, you can really see that he's taken a lot of liberties, as has happened with Rumi. Um, by some measures, Rumi is now said to be the most popular poet in America, 
uh, but he's popular in the translations of Coleman Barks. And of course, if you actually look at Rumi um, in Persian, um, the, the difficulties, I mean, these, the dif many difficulties are smoothed out and many things are ignored or, or um, altered in, in getting into what makes Americans feel good in terms of modern poetry. Um, let's, oh, any question? Uh, I recently learned that uh, Sufism may have originated among followers of Rumi. And uh, at what point did these religious prohibitions begin? I'm, I'm not used to associating drunkenness and such with uh, spiritual uh, Muslim poetry. Uh, anything, uh, statements. It, it goes back very far in the tradition. Um, and it, it's the, there is also a very nice back and forth sort of, you can always flip the coin and look at the other side effect. Um, because you, you find that the lover is transgressive because he loves, it, uh, he's, he loves his own beloved more than God. He, loves his, he calls his beloved an idol, and he worships his beloved and uses very explicitly religious terminology for his beloved, and he, he dr gets drunk and he runs out into the desert and, and carries on like a crazy mad lover. But of course, his, love, his beloved may be God. And so we have the picture of the, the, the lover with his clothes all ripped up, drunk, lying by the side of the road, and the pious sheikh goes past him on the way to the mosque and sneers at him and averts his eyes because he thinks of this reprobate as a, a very unsatisfactory, badly behaving person. But of course, in the Ghazal world, the lover knows the real inward joy of, of the presence of God, and the pious person is just observing the, the letter of the law but not the spirit of the law. So it can always, when we see the lover madly drunk and carrying on in a sacrilegious way, um, it can be both sacrilegious and it could be a, a sign of real absorption in, in God and of having the fuses of your mind and heart blown by contact with God. Because after all, Every, everybody, this, this goes to mysticism and Sufism in general. Every claim or attempt that you can comprehend or feel in your heart and your mind, the presence of the power that made the universe, is obviously, it's inexpressible and it's also impossible. You're gonna blow up. And so the imagery always comes from out of control areas of human life. Um, drunkenness, madness, sex, and death. Um, and this is, this is true in, in almost every mystical poetry that you can think of, that it, it fries your brain and it blows up your heart to try to encounter God. But that, of course, that doesn't stop people. Um, so the poetry is always balanced on that tension of doom and ecstasy and, and, and suffering. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a remarkable, and all this in little poems two lines long. So it's a, it's a very um, powerful genre. What would, you, what would you add to that, Mustafa? Right, no, and I, I would say that, yes, um, going back to the chronology of, of Sufism, that uh, it, uh, the earliest known Sufis, um, uh, I feel, would be around um, a couple of centuries, even before Rumi, uh, the tradition, I think, had started. It may not have become to be known as Sufism itself, uh, but it had started. And um, the, in Sufism, uh, actions can lead to philosophies, and philosophies can lead to actions as well. So the physical manifestation of uh, uh, drunkenness and sex and death uh, can, be, can be the result of, of certain philosophies, etc., or they can then compel a person to think a certain way. So in, on the philosophical plane, there were um, very um, established and still evolving philosophies such as Vahadatul um, Wajood and Vahadatul Shahood and stages of mysticism called um, uh, Fana and Baka. And uh, so these are all Vahadatul Wajood, for instance, is the unity of, of uh, existence. Vahadatul Shahood holds that um, um, God's um, existence is separate and man's existence is separate as well. And a fana is uh, sort of the, the last uh, stage or the second last stage, I should say, of, um, um, of uh, oneness with, with the divine and sort of uh, nirvana, if, if, if you would. Um, where things began to, to change as going to your 
um, a question about uh, how, when the prohibitions, etc., um, came in, and uh, how the, 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 what we see today in, in the media and um, in the public eye in general, this view of this brand of Islam that may be called uh, Wahhabism, for instance, a very strict orthodox fundamentalist kind of strain. So the strain, I, I feel, was, was always there. Uh, but yes, it was not as, um, as, as powerful or dominant or as ghalib, excuse the pun, uh, uh, as it is uh, now. Uh, uh, ghalib, ghalib also means, means yeah. dominant yeah. Uh, and, and sometimes overwhelming uh, as well. Uh, and so, but these things also seem to go in, in, in historical cycles. So there were, throughout the centuries, over a thousand years, various time periods, various areas where, yes, the, the current uh, uh, practice of Islam as put forth by the Taliban, for instance, uh, was dominant. Um, but there are large, large pockets of, uh, of, of Muslims, uh, I would say, who are still in the majority, um, who still hark back to the, to the more uh, 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 poetic and romanticized form of Islam than, uh, than the orthodox form that we see today. Let's, let's stop for a minute with, the, with, with our general discussions and just take a, a look at the specifics of, of one guzzle, just if you'll bear with me. I think it'll be worth it for examples. So I, I maintain a website here, and you can look up any of, any of Ghalib's guzzles. There's 234 of them, and they contain um, 1,459 little two-line verses. And this is guzzle one. And it has all sorts of extra things that go with it uh, that most of the guzzles don't have. Uh, it also has, as all the guzzles do have, the power for you to decide whether you want to look at the website in Urdu script or in the Hindi script. Because many people nowadays in India don't know the Urdu script, but they're able to read the same content very nicely in, in Devanagari script. So thanks to one of my really good graduate students who knows how to do these things with JavaScript, you have your, your viewing choices. Um, so this is, this is diacritic, such as is convenient for most of us. And this is the first guzzle in Ghalib's Divan. It has five verses. And the, you can see that every verse ends in ka, right? So that's the refrain. It means of. And every syllable before the ka is ir, has the form of ir, shir ka, sham shir ka, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the rhyme syllable, which is compulsory. The re refrain is optional, but the rhyme syllable is compulsory. And then you can see that the first verse has the rhyming elements at the end of each line. That makes it a matla. And that means that in an oral performance, once you'd heard the rhyming elements twice, you could tell how much was rhyme and how much was refrain. And until you'd heard them twice, you couldn't. So this is a preparation for oral performance. And then the last verse very commonly contains uh, the pen name of the poet. And so here it is. Um, and it's a way of signing an oral poem. You work your pen name right into the right into the last verse. In the bhakti tradition in medieval Hinduism, we have exactly the same sorts of, of devices, including the, the pen name at the end of the verse to, to be able to sign an oral poem. And the first, the first verse of the first guzzle is particularly interesting. And the reason I chose it for, for today's talk, because I knew we wouldn't have time to look at much. And in a way, it's the most interesting guzzle in any poet's divan. The divan is the full volume of his poetry, because it's the only one for which there are extra expectations, because it begins it begins the divan, and so many works by traditional Muslims always begin with some sort of hamd, some sort of praise of God. And so it's very, very strong expectation that when you, when you prepare your divan for copying, hand copying by a, a, a scribe or for publication, um, and Ghalib got his poetry published, he was right at the, right at the first decades when it was possible for a poet to get his own divan published, so he did. Um, and you, he, he knew that the expectation was that the first verse of the first guzzle had better be in praise of God. Everybody expects that. It's just how it's supposed to be. So he himself created 
a very clever way of not quite fulfilling those expectations, but not too conspicuously flouting them either. I'm just, I'm just hesitating on this because I just want you to think that if you go home and are interested in this, you can look at these, they're completely open to the public. And every verse has its own commentary page, and this one has a particularly long bunch because the commentators have argued about it a great deal. But um, every verse has a lot of, some of them have pictures just because I like pictures. But, um, but this is the kind of thing I've provided for him. And it's a, a study site for my work and it also aims to provide lots of materials and resources for the guzzles for people to study them, even if they don't have a university library at hand. So here is a very close, a very close study of this one verse. So naqsh, here's the definition, right? Um, naqsh means uh, a shape, a painting, a picture, a form, et cetera, et cetera. The naqsh. And then faryadi, faryad means complaint. And a faryadi means one who has a complaint. And in legal terms, it's like plaintiff in English, which also means one who has a, a plaint or a complaint. So the picture or the form is a, a complainer, a plaintiff, of whose mischievousness of writing. So that's our first, that's our first, um, line. And of course, writing, the word for writing has the meaning also of setting at liberty, which is why we talk about Tahrir Square when we talk about the, the Arab Spring. It's not about writing, it's about liberty. So you can see the, the multiple possibilities here. And Adam Oshira, remember, you only get the first line and then you have to wait and you can't look ahead. You have to, there's a, a narrative students call this the authoritarian narrator, that you're stuck, you can't look ahead. So the shape is a plaintiff of whose mischievousness of, of writing. Um, why don't you go ahead and recite it nicely, sure. uh, Mustafa. Naqsh faryadi hai kiski shokh ye tahreer ka. Naqsh faryadi hai kiski shokh ye tahreer ka. Kaaghzi hai pairahan har pay kare tasveer ka. Hmm. Of paper, kaghaz is the paper. Of paper is the garment of every form, face, countenance, shape, of or in the picture. So obviously people asked Ghalib about that. What is this paper business? What are paper garments? And he had to reply in a letter. So here is his reply, which is my translation from the Urdu. Um, and you can see that he's used to being asked questions like this because he says, uh, First, listen to the meaning of the meaningless verses, meaning at the beginning of his letter to someone, he's going to answer so someone's complaint that several of his verses were meaningless. And he does, he answers it for several verses, but one of them is this. As for Naqshvaryadi, that's this verse that he's going to explain, in Iran, there is the custom that the seeker of justice, putting on paper garments, goes before the ruler, as in the case of lighting a torch in the day or carrying a blood-soaked cloth on, on a um, bamboo pole to protest an injustice. Thus, the poet reflects of whose mischievousness of writing is the image a plaintiff, since the aspect of a picture is that its garment is of paper. That is to say, although existence may be like that of pictures, merely notional, it is a cause of grief and sorrow and suffering. And the commentators have complained, the, the early and authoritative commentator um, famously said that's a meaningless verse, that's very bad, and the other commentators disagree, and so forth. But you can see how cleverly framed it is because it doesn't attack God, but you would certainly not call it a praise of God either. It presents itself as a naive question. Gee, I'm looking at a picture, and I notice that all the shapes and forms in the picture are wearing robes of paper. So they must be plaintiffs, they must be seeking recourse against injustice. And so, against whom are they seeking recourse? So you, you read, after you hear the second Misra, you realize the basic, sorry, Misra means line. After you hear the second line, 
you realize the basis of the first line, that once you have seen a picture and thought about all those paper garments that those poor, <laughs> static, helpless people in the picture are wearing, um, then you realize that you may wonder whose mischievousness of writing are they complaining of that they were drawn badly? Because obviously a figure in a picture has no power of movement, it can't control its looks or its appearance, it has no volition. It looks like, a, it looks as though it's moving, it looks as though it has human attributes, but it actually doesn't. Someone has mischievously drawn it or mischievously drawn it badly. It's very hard to tell um, about that. So there's a lot of wordplay here of, of words for writing and drawing and, and paper and such. But this is an extremely famous uh, verse, it, it was used Nakshvaryadi um, was used as, as a, with a slightly transformed form within his office as the title of, of a collection by Fez Ahmed Fez, who is a very popular modern Urdu poet, um, kind of the favorite poet, poet of a lot of Pakistanis along with Iqbal. Um, so everybody has been a Everybody has been a Ghalib fan in Urdu literature ever since, kind of officially a Ghalib fan. Um, and, or almost everybody, there's Yagana who hasn't, but yes. most everybody has. <laughs> and um, this verse is known to everybody who knows anything about Ghalib. So it's a good verse for us to look at and just to see how, what tiny little poems these are and how they have to make use of lots of resources to make a powerful effect on us, even though they're only like 15 or 20 words long. So this is, this is our first look at, our first look at the verse, which is sort of raw material for discussion. So do you want to, what would you add, Mustafa? Um, sure, I'd say that um, the uh, Indo-Persian languages uh, tradition, uh, you could call it, is that uh, a lot of uh, words have multiple meanings and shades of meaning as well, which uh, lends uh, such a beautiful uh, complexity and multi-layeredness to uh, Urdu and, and uh, Indo-Persian and Arabic poetry. As you can see from Fran's website, that just you get that there are so many different words um, for just one word. And you can literally take each word and plug in a different meaning and shade of meaning and come up with a different interpretation or a slightly different shade of, of meaning and experience as well. Um, so that's there. And um, I would say especially on, um, on the point of uh, Ghalib choosing this as the opening verse of his divan. So, we know of Ghalib's uh, personality and his through his life as well that he was uh, a, a very self-assured person. And you can see his personal as well as poetic conceit, as it were, to choose this couplet over there. Um, and ironically, we can also see, we, we can interpret it in terms of irony as well because as he's asking the question of whose uh, mischievousness is this Naqsh uh, uh, creation of, he himself is the person who is actually writing. He is creating the Naqsh <laughs> himself. So in a very tongue-in-cheek way, he is referring to himself as divine, as God as well. And uh, especially if you take the meaning, a shade of meaning of Shokhi as not just mischievousness, but wantonness, uh, <clears throat> and the meaning of tahrir as setting free. By the act of creating something, you are actually setting it free or creating it, you are actually um, freeing it from your own mind. Um, you can also see the, 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 uh, a lot of shades of meaning coming, coming in there. So he could be referring to himself as well. And it, it reminds me of, of uh, that line from, um, from, from, from King Lear, um, as flies to wanton boys are we to the gods, they kill us for their sport. And uh, so you can see sort of that uh, in there as well. And Fran is right, this uh, uh, particular couplet has been debated endlessly uh, as well. 
But you should notice that, of course, the first line is a question. And right. so it does not say, it, it, it's perhaps a naive question, gee, who has done this mischievous right. or bad writing or drawing? Um, I don't know. And so if anybody says it's God, it's we who say it's God. It's not the, it's the speaker. Right. The speaker simply asks a question. And in fact, there's, there's a lovely rhetorical feature of the guzzle that's, that's, that's um, a common trait, especially in, in um, Ghalib and Mir, the two greatest masters, the preference for inshaya over khabariya speech. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a sort of rhetorical distinction that exists in, in um, Persian poetic theory also. Khabariya is, it gives you khabar, it gives you information. Like the sky is blue is a khabariya statement. An inshaiya statement would be, is the sky blue? How blue the sky is. I wish the sky were blue. Uh, perhaps the sky might be blue. If the sky were blue, et cetera, et cetera. So almost, any, almost anything that's not a falsifiable informative statement is called inshaiya. And it opens so many possibilities because a first line like that, um, it could be an, an exclamation also. Oh my, how extraordinary. Why are all these figures in the picture wearing paper robes? Or it could be an innocent question of someone who really has no idea. Or it could be a cynical question. Yeah, who are they complaining about? You and I know who they're complaining about, don't we? So in a lot of these little two-line verses, the tone is everything, but you have to provide the tone, because nothing in the verse tells you the tone in which it is to be recited. So you may hear it recited, if it, a very small number of people would ever have heard Ghalib recite that verse. So when you read it on paper, which is how most people encountered it, um, every time the perf someone recites it, you have to recite it in, 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 in a tone, and that that guides the interpretation too. You, you inevitably help to create the verse yourself. And that's part of the, the fascination and enjoyment of these tiny little, tiny little poems that are partly do it yourself. And so you have to work extra hard on them and that enhances their meaning. Did you have a question? Is he uh, concerned in some way? This to me, by the way, seems almost like a gauntlet flung, flung down in the face of whatever a reader may take offense or not. But is he concerned throughout his work with an inherent slipperiness about language that so many poets have talked about? Elliot says, when I talk to you, I have to use words. The Zen poet says, uh, if you say a one word, you go to hell as fast as an arrow. So <laughs> is, that, is that something about the media? He wasn't worried about going to hell because he, all the Ghazal poets knew that the themes or the mazmoons of these verses were given by the tradition. So if he, wrote a, if he wrote a verse that said, oh, I tear my clothes off and run around in the desert getting drunk, no one would think that was an autobiographical statement. Everybody would realize that was just an expression of the, the themes of the Ghazal world and he was speaking in the voice of the mad lover who essentially is the inhabitant of the Ghazal world. So there are lots and lots of verbal devices that he used, and he certainly cared about them, and people have tried to analyze them and figure them out ever since. But there's no indication that he had a lot of anxiety about them. He, even in his, in his generation, um, he certainly had, a, he was controversial because a lot of times earlier Ghazal poets had gone in for like straightforward love poetry, you know, lyrical, romantic, sweet, adorable, nice. And then he brings in, sort of like John Donne, you know, the metaphysical poet, he brings in the flea and writes about the flea that bites his beloved, John Donne does, I mean, or the drawing compass image that are not smooth and romantic, they're kind of lumpy and cerebral and metaphysical. So I think that Ghalib is more like done than like any other English poet. And he, he delighted in using awkward, edgy, um, unheard of kinds of word and image play. And he, he, was, he had many detractors, but he also had many great admirers. He was very famous for his poet, poetry and his, and his letters also, and his um, Urdu and Persian ones both. So there's a lot there's a lot to be said on this subject, and um, God knows any of you who are interested can probably find more information than you want on my website. <laughs> did you did you have anything to add, oh, Mustafa? Uh, sure, yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. Just, uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, if you could answer it briefly, it's a big question. Uh, Ghalib's poetry what are the origins of the gazelle? 
of the deer or the poem? The poem. Um, well, uh, it, it started in Arabic. I'm not, I'm not right. so good on this because I do not know Arabic. Um, so it started, it grew out of longer forms of poetry. It was one part of uh, an introductory part of, of a kind of longer genre in Arabic. Um, shortly before the coming of Islam, so like the sixth century. Um, and and um, it really was a minor genre in Arabic, but when it came into Persian, then it exploded and became extremely important and became um, a major form of, of literary, romantic, and mystical ex expression in Persian and then in Turkish and, and Urdu also. So it's never been a big deal in Arabic, but it did begin in Arabic. Yes. Uh, I was surprised to hear you say that there was no uh, performances of puzzles are no longer uh, that popular uh, because oh, there was a woman who was known internationally as a puzzle singer. Uh, I think she was Egyptian, I won't swear to it. Uh, who died some years ago in her 70s. Um, um Kalsum, right? Yeah. Yes. yes. And, uh, you know, internationally, there was a great passion and outpouring of grief and all. And I had the impression that uh, household singers were sort of like rock stars. Uh, well, now in Urdu, this can be the case, but I believe Um Kalsum sang um, modern poems that were not guzzles or older poems that were guzzles. I really don't know. Does anybody know Arabic and know what Um, um Kalsum used to sing? I don't know Arabic, but I had a patient who uh, was a Egyptian who was a great, great admirer of the culture, who also had political views, not always one thing or on the left. But uh, my impression was that uh, she was singing about popular themes and not any particular mystical. Uh, mm -hmm. She talked a lot about love, a lot of broken hearted lovers. I don't think there was any religious significance in her body. She made a lot of movies, she made a lot of records, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'd, I'd say that, I mean, the kind of uh, ground that uh, Ghalib broke and, and set up uh, then uh, gave, gave way to a lot of evolution. In, uh, in the way that uh, mushairas are held, their frequencies, uh, the, way that, uh, the, that the way that Urdu poetry is sung, how it's read, how it's practiced, the whole range of experiences. So uh, I, I believe, I, I agree with, with Fran when she says that yes, mushairas are not as popular today as they used to be. And mushairas are the uh, gathering of poets who are going to be reciting their own work primarily. So there is that performance. And yes, they, they, the, their frequency, at least in, in Pakistan and in India, from what I know and have experienced, has gone down. And uh, I would say it's, it, to a large degree, it's because of um, the, the times and the pace of life now. Um, and the modernization process, et cetera, that's going on in these, in Urdu-speaking societies. Um, there's also, of course, the big question in, in uh, Pakistan, the big issue of security. As well, um, things have not been very stable for the past uh, two decades or so. So there's a certain risk to having large gatherings uh, and uh, having people be in one place. And mushairas were usually held uh, during, the, during the evening and night hours, etc. So that's one reason for that as well. Performance-wise, there are singing performances of poetry as well. So more along the lines of uh, Umm Kulsum and individual uh, singers who were very who became famous for singing Urdu poetry, they have found um, um, outlets and uh, uh, survival through modern media. So through the intervention of radio and TV and now the internet, you find that ghazal, singing performance of the ghazal uh, live on and, um, as you witnessed, like the, the opening ghazal that we had that was playing when you were walking in was uh, by um, uh, a singer called Talat Mahmood who was singing it uh, a good uh, 30, 40 years ago, uh, if not uh, earlier than that, but because of YouTube. 
we have those as well. Um, but yes, even on that, um, even on that side of performance, things are getting tougher in terms of uh, the sheer number of people who are now practicing the, the classical art of ghazal singing, which is also, and ghazal would then uh, be, be fused with the, with the whole science and art of Indian uh, classical music, which has its own, whole, which is a whole science on its own. Mm -hmm. uh, and interest and patience in acquiring that art is also going down. But now with the intervention, again, evolution keeps happening. So now you have this mixing of, of uh, pop uh, genres coming into contact with classical Indian music and uh, um, modern Urdu poetry coming into contact with, with classical and uh, sort of a, a, a mishmash occurring and something new uh, coming out of it. So if you ask uh, members of the younger generation, especially in Pakistan, um, if, uh, if Urdu music, they would call it Urdu music, um, is uh, alive and well, they, you would definitely get, uh, get a very affirmative answer, even if they, they uh, do not uh, listen to it much. Um, and there's, of, of course, also the regional folk influence as well. In the regions of India and Pakistan, Urdu is, of course, just one of the languages that, that is spoken. It's the official language of Pakistan and the official language of five states in India. But then there's a myriad number of other languages that are spoken. And they all sort of interact with each other, flow uh, in and out of each other, and new things come out of those as well. People, people have said a lot, and, and perhaps you folks know something about the Hindi-Urdu split. Um, of, are they two languages or one? Are they kind of a Siamese twin um, compound or what? And there's been a lot of tension, of course, because Hindi is the official language of India and Urdu is the official language of Pakistan, and yet they share a common grammar and a large amount of common basic vocabulary, and then they have two different sources for their fancy vocabulary and two different scripts. But um, the real threat to both of them, in my view, is English now. South Asians are picking up English at an, an astonishing pace. Mm -hmm. And the really sad thing is there is, as, as Mustafa said, there's a long and strong tradition of being multilingual in South Asia. Not in a pretentious way, but perhaps you would speak one language in your village, and if you went to market in a neighboring town, there would be a different dialect there. Right. And if you were a highly educated man of an upper class, you might have a separate language that you would use for, for diplomatic or, or literary purposes. Um, but. So you would think that English could be sustained along with, um, an, you know, at least one South Asian language. But in my observation, this is not happening. My friends who are Urdu walas or Hindi walas who are really interested in these languages and literatures, their kids have all been sent to English medium schools, meaning the medium of instruction is in English. And they have tried very hard to make their kids fluent in Hindi or Urdu with varying success. But if you go to the kids' rooms and look at what they're choosing to read, you know it's English. And if you put two of those kids in a room together, you know they're gonna be speaking English to each other. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, a big um, uh, problem for the future of this language at a, at, a, at an elite level, because um, of course they may know Urdu for speaking to servants or something like that, but their fancy education, their literary and artistic uh, vocabulary and thinking often happens in, in English. And so this is the high end side of, of Urdu where if you don't have a good background in grammar and, and a sense of the meter and the poetry and the Persianized vocabulary, it's very hard for you. In fact, the most, the most heartfelt letters of thanks I get are from South Asians living in the West who say, thank you for your website. Uh, I always wanted to understand the poetry of Ghalib, and I never could, but you've explained it all in English, so now I can. <laughs> and um, it's, it's, it's just something that's happening. And then the migration of the Ghazal into English is kind of fascinating, too, because, of course, it's yeah. what is it in English? It doesn't have the meter, so is it the Ghazal or not? A whole set of questions. But new things are happening all over the place, and so we might as well celebrate and, and enjoy them. But never, but the Definitely, English in South Asia is just becoming, uh, it's, with every generation, it's, it's absolutely taking over. And 
I don't know what the, the future will hold, but, but this is a very, very strong trend. And I don't see any, any retreat from it or any counter trends. Do you? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't say that there's a retreat uh, from it. Um, I would say that, again, there is a, a process of uh, sort of um, uh, Urduizing it or, or Englishizing it. Yeah, new uh, hybrids as it coming were. out. New, new, new hybrids are coming out. Um, and uh, slowly, so, so I think even if every person in South Asia became an English speaker exclusively, that English would differ markedly from the English spoken in England or the US because it would still have that, that flavor. Because of course, as we all know that language is more than just the words in that language. It's a whole set of historical and cultural experiences and values um, that uh, come with it uh, as well. Yes. The audience um, for poetry is just poetry, you know, in its native culture. And what percentage of the population did that audience represent? Was it widespread, or was it just a particular echelon? Uh, how many women read uh, read it, or who were the people that were reading it? Who was it he, he talking to? Well. Well, remember, most of them were not reading it uh, because because most people were illiterate, for one thing. But certainly in Ghalib's Delhi and in Agra, where he was born and lived before he moved to Delhi, um, this kind of language, the what Hindustani or what we now call Urdu, was a lingua franca, increasingly Persian. Persian had been the elite language of the Mughal court, but by, by the time Ghalib was living there, um, the British were in charge. And gradually, the balance was shifting away from Persian toward the local languages, and so, and so many people would understand this poetry. And in fact, there are anecdotes in Tazkiras about how it would disseminate because there would be mushairas where poets would recite their latest verses. And of course, at those mushairas would be servants um, serving, the, serving the, the food and drinks and taking care of people. And so instantly, the servants would pass the word on because these things are so short. And if you know the meter system and the language, they're very memorizable and very recordable. So the dancing girls would know them immediately and have them <laughs> memorized. And the dancing girls and the musicians would want to have the latest uh, verses. And they would arrange for disseminating them. And it, there doesn't seem to have been a, a problem. Because remember, most poets were not as complicated as Ghalib. So most of the time, people were doing more straightforward love and longing poetry or perhaps mystical, mystical poetry. But it wasn't exceedingly difficult or complex or in your face hard the way Ghalib's verses often were. Right, and there was also the, the aspect of being uh, very alive to the preferences of one's patron as well, although Ghalib uh, was exceptional in that as well, that he was, was a very self-assured person and he could get away with uh, a lot that um, other poets could not. Because um, uh, again, in, in 18th century India, you could, the only way that you could be earning your living by our pen was if you had patronage from a wealthy noble or an emperor and were associated with their court. Um, and so uh, even if you were not writing something for the court, uh, you still had to, you, you, it, it carried a little bit of risk if you wrote something that uh, would not be um, well received by our patron, then yes, you were really um, writing yourself out of a livelihood <laughs> kind of thing. And, uh, but Ghalib, of course, uh, because of his stature, et cetera, was, would, would be given a lot more leeway than uh, anyone else would as well. And he had some troubles. Right, he, yeah. he got into some, some troubles uh, as well. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so the short answer to your question would be that yes, they were writing primarily for 
uh, the, the, the courts and uh, people who of socioeconomic and educational status who were associated with the courts, but that does not mean that their, their poetry was not understood by people outside of that circle. I'm fascinated by the multiplicity of meanings in poetry and, I, and, and, and the depth of, or the layers of um, interpretation that allows for it. Do you think that's a fundamental factor in the formation of this form of poetry, that it can be brief but very resonant at the same time? Would it have worked as well with another type of language? That's such an, an interesting question. I'm, I'm glad you, you asked that. Um, in, in, in the strong sense, since Urdu ghazal comes right out of Persian ghazal, in fact, the, the birth of Urdu ghazal was part of the death of Persian in India. People kind of took all the, the devices and the structures and the meters and the, the, the technical and, and genre features that they loved in Persian and started doing them in Urdu, and then they didn't need Persian anymore. At that point, people were starting to feel that Persian was an alien language in a way that they hadn't before for, for a lot of reasons. So in the strong sense, it came right out of Persian. But there are so many things that you can do in, in Urdu because of things that we can't, because of, of constraints that you don't have, that we do have in English, that it's, it's, it's quite striking. For example, we don't, you don't have capital letters and the kind of punctuation. If you, if you see punctuation in modern Divans of Ghali, which you do, it's imposed by a modern editor. They put English-style punctuation into Ghalib's poetry, which is, of course, quite ridiculous, because he certainly would never have done that or have wanted that to be done. But there is also a lot of things like, um, in, in, in English, we, can, we have to make a distinction between the sky is blue and is the sky blue. It's, it's because of the inversion. In Urdu, you have, you know, asman nila hai, and there's a kya, a yes or no question marker in front. Kya asman nila hai, but it can also be colloquially omitted. So asman nila hai can register as a question or an exclamation, um, if you wish, as well as a, a statement. So there's a lot of, of, of features that are very well mobilized by, by Ghalib and Mir and other poets, but especially by Ghalib and Mir, to create multiple meanings in these little tiny poems. And I don't think you could do it as well in, certainly you couldn't do it as well in English. And that's why translations of Ghalib as a rule just fail. Um, I have a couple of guzzles with anthologies of translations so that every, anybody who wishes can compare and see what the translators have achieved. Um, you have to honor them because they're bound to fail, because, but it can't, be, it can't be done. But you can see my translations are totally lousy and clunky, um, and they're just meant to help push you back to the Urdu with more understanding. They're not remotely meant to be literary. Um, and no doubt there are things we can do in English that, that you can't do in Urdu, but there's a lot of things that you can do in Urdu, partly because um, you have a different word. You, instead of prepositions, you have postpositions. So instead of saying in the house, you say house in. And so at the ends of sentences and at the end of lines, you also have your verbs there. So it's easier to rhyme in Urdu than it is in English because your verbs often have common endings that make all verbs in a certain tense easy to rhyme with each other. And postpositions end, and can end the line. That postposition, ka, that means of. And so it can be of this and of that, you know, of writing, of a picture. But since the of comes at the end, it rhymes. And in English, you'd have to say of the picture, of the writing. And so you can't get the same facility there. But of course, you know, there are, um, it's, it's hard to make any meaningful comparison because really nobody has tried to do what Ghalib did exactly in English, but we do have other effects. I think a, a fascinating uh, um, analysis to your question might be to compare Urdu to uh, with the Native American languages. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the the, the Hopi um, uh, language um, spoken by by the Hopi Indians um, uh, also did not have uh, sort of had a very loosely um, constructed sense of time. Uh, which you see in, in Urdu is also very different from, uh, from the concept of time in English. So for instance, in Urdu we have the same word, one word for yesterday as well as tomorrow. Um, and I, it, it would be a, a fascinating line of inquiry. I, I haven't done this, and I don't know if anyone else has, has done it or not. But I wonder if someone, like Native American poetry, in, 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 as, as it was written, would that be 
would that remind one of uh, Urdu poetry or not, simply because of the, the way that the, the, the words were constructed, etc. And in Urdu um, as well, it, it's a syllable timed language uh, as well, in the sense that the syllables are approximately of the same length, and so they occur at approximately regular intervals as well. As, as well, so you don't find one very short syllable, but with one very long syllable as well, which also adds a, a lot to the rhythm of uh, of, of the of the poetry uh, as well. So, there were yeah. stresses, right? Because when you were reciting uh, this opening verse, I could hear there were stresses. Uh, were you that? Right, I was introduced. Right, because it it was my own sort of. Uh, um, a bias and internalization of my own experience as I was growing up. It was, I was reading it the way that I had heard it recited mm -hmm. and the, the traditional way of reciting it as well. And the, the meter has, has it, the feet are there as well. So um, a lot of people would, would recite it as Naqsh Faryadi hai kiski shokhiye tehreer ka ka ghazi hai pehrahan har pehr kare tasveer ka Whereas I was reading it as Naqsh Faryadi hai kiski shokhi hai tehreer ka ka ghazi hai pehrahan har pehr kare tasveer ka. So I was actually adding those. So those I, can, I can add an interesting little highlight here. Uh, my friend Ralph Russell, a very um, well-known writer in the field of, of um, Urdu literature and the author of the best book on, on Ghalib's life. It's called Ghalib Life and Letters by Ralph Russell and his collaborator Khushid al Islam. But he also was interested in meter. And I've, I've made a little handbook to teach people meter and put it on my website. He also made a handbook to teach his students meter, but he had a slightly different approach. But for this particular meter, um, he had an English folk song that he thought corresponded to it. Oh my darling, oh my darling, <laughs> oh my darling, Clementine. And this meter is dum da dum 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 da dum 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 da dum 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 da dum. Nak shafariya di hakiski shokhiye tahrir ka. But of course, the difference is we have stress meter in English of a very flexible and, and disputable kind, whereas the meter here is, strictly speaking, it's supposed to be quantitative, so that a long syllable is supposed to take twice as long to say as a short syllable, um, not to go higher or lower or more or less stressed, so that you have the opportunity to do as you like with your voice, um, provided you're keeping to the time um, structure of it. And some people ex extend that privilege very far. Of my two main ustads, one of them recites very elaborately, Nakshafariyadi, you know, <laughs> caresses the words, and my other ustad snorts when he hears that performance, and he considers it improper, and one should just recite plainly, plainly, and let the words do the work. Uh, but of course, we don't know how Ghalib recited, so. Oh, please. If I may add to that, so, um, and especially in this level, there are many instances, you know, especially in Ghalib's poetry, when you go and you read the, the, the mantra and then the mantra, and you go back to the mantra, you would read it differently. Uh, and I would almost guarantee for this particular lesson that when you read the mantra, the last chair, you would come back to this, and you would read it differently, you would interpret it differently, you would stress on the different words that if you had no idea what the, what the rest of the and it, much more than that, I would say, there are a great many verses of Ghalib, because the real poetic unit is the verse and not the ghazal, that after you had heard the second line, you would go back and reread or re-understand in your mind the first line, which is really a way of making a two-line verse feel like a three or four-line verse, because you have to go back in your head and reinterpret the first line, which is quite spectacular. Right. Yeah, I think it's a question. Oh. oh yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I, this is a little interdisciplinary. But first, I, I just was thinking of the bards of ancient Persia, the kind of sing-song way of speaking, you know, when, when they told the story of Alexander the Great or whatever. But I'm also, being a painter, I'm also thinking of the Persian miniatures and the Indian miniatures and the compartmentalization of little images and the way they interact with one another and the very tight structure they're involved with and the metaphors that are involved between a cloud and a dragon and the water. I mean, mm -hmm. there are certain signs for, and I wonder what is the, 
what interaction did the painters, or I guess it's the whole culture, but what, I mean, it's an interesting analogy that there are, you know, these interactions that take place. Do you have any, do they, relationship between the miniatures or anything? Or, or do you know anything in, in that area? Anne-Marie Schimmel actually used a very nice image. Um, when, when people used to complain that, oh, the Guzzle's uh, themes were too hackneyed and, and boring and it, we needed to give up the Guzzle and start writing much freer forms of poetry in Urdu, um, she compared classical Guzzle and its themes to paintings of, of Majnoon in the desert, you know, the lovers Layla and Majnoon. Uh, Majnoon ran off into the desert and became a naked madman cared for by the animals when he couldn't get his beloved Layla. And so painter after painter has painted Majnoon, scrawny and naked, hanging out in the desert, being taken care of by the wild animals. But every painter, as, as Anne-Marie Schimmel said, would show his individuality by small touches. Mm -hmm. So everybody painted the same scene, but the great painter painted it differently, had, had some extra thing or some trick of the light or some new way of framing the, the figure of Majnoon that, that made it all the more memorable because then it stood out from the similar paintings of everybody else. And that's, I think something like that happens when you all use the same mazmoons, uh, the same themes, that your treatment of the theme becomes much more striking um, if you've got something original out of it against a background of, of sort of well-established tradition. But there's also something inherent then in the structure of the language and in structure of the images because they're so highly uh, terse and tight and, 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 they're miniatures, and, and, they're miniatures. Yeah, yeah, and each little image has a universe within it, and yet it also, the whole has a large, so I wondered something in the philosophic tradition or where, you know, this, this, this concept of structure, it's so, so deep in that middle, you know, in the, in the Southeast Asia, yeah. Do you have a, do you have a, a sense of where this could go? Um. I'd, I'd say that yes, it, it, it's, a, it's a great uh, observation, and, and honestly, yes, I, I haven't uh, thought uh, too much uh, about it, but again, just yes, thinking of um, the, the, the poetry and the art, as, and, and the, the visual art as, as it was occurring, uh, then yes, there are, like you could say that the art is, is very poetic, and uh, the, the poetry is very, very visual uh, as well, mm -hmm. and, um, I really, uh, but ca can we say that, um, for instance, if we look at, at, at uh, Western art and, and Western poetry, that uh, the same kind of that are the images and the, the language structure or the poetical structure much more, much looser, like what would be an example uh, of that? It's not as the, I mean, romantic painting, maybe in romantic poetry, you could make some analogies, but this is so tight. Mm -hmm. Deep within mm -hmm. the structural, the very thing, the building blocks are so are, have such a interaction with one another. Because I mean, I've always been struck by the Persian miniatures by their um, their telling telling stories that unfold and unfold and then go off the borders, you know. <laughs> but they're still so you know, but they're still so you know enclosed and at the same time escape the border. I mean, I, I don't think this happens in the poetry, does it? Does anything ever escape the structure, go off? I mean, leave the structure? Um, yes, occasionally it, it does. And now you, you find it happening more and more as the ghazal structure itself becomes looser or uh, poetry is, is written in, in other formal structures other than the ghazal. So yes, uh, especially for instance in the postmodernist uh, Urdu literature, yes, you find a multiplicity of uh, images that uh, uh, may not be connected with any kind of deliberate intent on, on, on the writer's part um, as well. Oh, is, uh, is, you mean they're connected, they're, the writing and yes, the... Yes, many of the... Yeah. A good part of the... Shah, 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 Sh
Absolutely. Right. Well, think about how English poets now complain, because up until recently, English poets could assume that everybody knew the King James Bible and the imagery from the Bible, and they had a common set of, of uh, you know, stories that everybody knew and names they could refer to and comparisons they could make, and that was also informed European painting. Of course, there were so many paintings of biblical scenes and, and um, such poems or poems from the Iliad and the Odyssey and the classical tradition, but now um, an English poet, where does he or she go to get common imagery? It's much harder in the, in the culture now because we just don't have that same body of guaranteed uh, a guaranteed known material. I mean, what do we have? Star Wars. I mean, it's it's a, it's um, it's a, a touchy a touchy subject. In right. right. I mean, uh, on the subject of Star Wars, there's in in as, and you mentioned Shahnama, for instance. So there were these. There's a long tradition of uh, epics uh, and and epic prose in um, uh, Indo-Persian uh, literature as well, just as there is in, in Western uh, literature. So you have King Arthur's tales, et cetera. In Urdu, you have the, the Dastani Amir Hamza, which uh, Fran actually has done a lot of extensive work on. And uh, it's funny you mentioned uh, visual arts and poetry, because uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, the Emperor Akbar uh, in uh, 1600s in India had commissioned a whole panel of paintings uh, that are just depictions of scenes from the Dastani Amir Hamza as well. And so, yes, in a way, the, the written word sort of dictates as well what will be painted and how it will be painted as well. Um, and uh, now I, I wonder if, if the reverse can happen as well. I mean, I, I know a lot of uh, literary works which have been painted, but I don't know about a lot of paintings which have actually been then written about in terms of, like, has there been a poem written on a certain picture well, or not the, in, in... Uh, the word Japanese haiku sometimes, well, they're always putting, making calligraphic experimentation. It's been wrong for several hundred years. Have these, I'm talking about the miniatures now, but articulating what woman has said, has, have there been any contemporary or older experiments with language itself, this language being modified from an artistic point of view or, or interpreted within that culture? Sure, actually, and I believe Fran is probably looking for the link to the calligraphy the, I'm looking slide for, that you have. No, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking, I'm, I'm going to look for um, the, um, because in that case, Ghalib commented about painting. It's the one yes. case that I know of. Give me a minute to, to find this. And yes, so calligraphy, definitely, there's, there's a long tradition of uh, uh, ca calligraphy in um, Indo-Persian uh, Indian culture as well. And yes, uh, there were different styles uh, as well. I'm not sure if the styles themselves were um, were influenced by the particular language uh, or not. Uh, but uh, yes, that, that, that is a question worth investigating. Here's a present, a present for you and any other art, art history fans. Here is the one, the one um, verse about which Ghalib explicitly commented in, in painting terms. Just look at what he said and then we'll look at the verse. He says, Raqib, of course, has the meaning of opponent. That is to say, ardor is the enemy of proper possession. The proof is that Qais, which Qais is the real name of the lover Majnun. He was mad, therefore he was called Majnun, which means possessed by jinns. So Qais is the mad lover who in life wandered around naked, remained naked even within the veil of a picture. The pleasure of it is that Majnun is always pictured with his body naked whenever he is pictured. But of course this is atypical. This is the only case I know where he actually um, interpreted his own verse in terms of, of painting. But, but this is a neat case. Because remember, you'd only get the first line. Shok harang rakibe sarosama nikla. Ardor in every color, mood, mode, aspect. It literally means color, but of course it has related meanings of all sorts. Turned out to be a rival or enemy or opponent of sarosama, which means something like uh, dignity, proper possession, being a bourgeois kind of thing. Um, and when you hear that line, you have no idea what's going on. 
It's a very abstract statement and it's incomprehensible, it's uninterpretable. So then you have to wait at the Mushaira after the poet has read the first line and then everybody says, va va, subhanallah, and, and starts praising him and maybe they make him repeat the first line and there's a big interval when you're trying to think of what the second line would be. Only when you hear the second line, um, Qais is majnoon, there's that same word tasvir that we saw in the earlier right. verse we were looking at. Tasvir ke parda maybe, parda means veil, it's like the word people use in English, P-U-R-D-A-H, uh, which they pronounce purda sometimes, but it's parda, it means being in a curtain or being behind a curtain. Qais, even, this is even, in the curtain of a painting turned out to be naked or emerged naked. So, uh, in other words, Qais, or the figure of Mad Majnoon, who ran off and lived nakedly in, with the animals in the desert, was so opposed to all civilized, bourgeois, urbane existence that um, even in the parda of a picture, which ought to veil him or, or cover him like a paper garment, as we saw in the, in the other verse we were looking at, even in the parda of a picture which ought to make for modesty, he turned out to be naked. And Ghalib is very pleased because he's created that nice little effect that he feels is very enjoyable and that surely the, um, the Mushaira hearers probably probably enjoyed it as well because nikla can mean turned out to be, but it also can mean literally emerged. So it can actually mean even in the parda of a picture, Qais emerged naked, as though he was so much breaking, so much concerned to break down the, the dignity and pompousness of bourgeois life that his, his um, incisiveness just cut through. Um, all the pomp and circumstance that surrounds him, even in a picture. So it's a lovely, it's a lovely verse, and it's 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 anchored to the depiction of of Christ in the wilderness. Let me interrupt for a moment. I'm sorry, I don't mean to. We've only got uh, five minutes left, and I'd like to uh, pass around uh, this material on the Hoshar Foundation for people to take a look at as we're finishing. Oh, that's lovely of you. It's a, it's a and wonderful foundation, and and we know we know the people who are running it and every penny goes right to women's education in Pakistan. It's not a big organization buying Range Rovers for a lot of outside experts coming in. It's people working with local schools. Right, so people can make a note of their website if they want it's, to. It's Look. interesting, my initial question, which was answered directly, and then picked up by this woman also, the question of the vulgarity, you know, sex, death, madness, Right, and yes, uh, with, with the caveat that yes, it was uh, many times uh, within the veil of the masculine gender, but everyone knew to interpret it as both as well. And uh, yes, I completely agree, they did use their poetic license to very good <laughs> and very intense effect to talk about uh, the, these things, you know, and um, to really, um, Link them as as Fran was mentioning earlier that you know the, these were mystical themes, um, and even in this um, um, uh, couplet over here, the the the, the interplay of uh, parda and orian of nakedness and hidden, it's always uh, the, the 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 native um, uh, speaker or, or reader will automatically almost subconsciously be drawn into the contradiction between the the hidden what what we really know do we really know anything going to to Descartian philosophy etc uh, as well um, but yes uh, I, I do feel that uh, they did use their 
their, their poetic license, as I was saying, uh, to, to, to talk about things uh, that weren't the topics of, of everyday conversation in prose, for instance, between uh, a, a couple of uh, people who were just chatting in the marketplace, for instance. You know. Sure. Yes, uh, it, it it could have because uh, in in the Middle uh, Ages, uh, you know, the there was a whole flowering of uh, Andalusian and South Southern Spanish Moorish culture, and the Arabs are famously um, supposed to have uh, rescued Greek science and philosophy from oblivion while Europe was going through its mm -hmm. Dark Ages. I mean, these these are of course very loose time periods and, and categorizations. Right. Oh yes, definitely. Right, definitely. So so there's hardly any uh, poetry in the classical period which talks just about um, uh, sex or drunkenness or death just on their own as phenomenon. It's always tied, it's always uh, a road, um, a metaphor for a broader um, achievement of uh, consciousness or dissipation of oneself into the divine whole. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop. Uh, Thank you I know very for myself, much. I feel like a door has opened into a wonderful mansion. Thank you so much. Thank we you. Really Thank you very much. Our pleasure.